Okay, so this is a follow-up video to the um, point of view video that Jake and I made. Uh, a couple people asked for the same thing. They wanted to see the cars. So I'm doing a quick video of the cars. We're going to start with the 23. So again, 1923 T bucket based on a Ford Model T. Now, got to use the term loosely based because there's so little of a real Model T here, but here's what's original to a Model T. The windshield, both upper and lower. The windshield braces. Uh, the firewall, or part of the firewall. Headlights. Radiator shroud are original 1923 Ford Model T parts. Everything else is kit or donor car. So the engine is Ford 302 connected to a Ford C4 transmission going into a Ford 9 inch rear which you can't see. Um, those are out of a 67 to 70 something mm, Falcon I believe. Um, or Mustang, there was a few cars that it would have come in. Um, actually, the steering column I found out came out of a 6970 Mustang. Um, so it's very possible that all of this came out of a Mustang. It's all connected some way or another. But, uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. The interior, you can see, is fairly sparse. I mean... You know, I'm running simple dolphin gauges. I know a lot of guys sit there and say, yeah, it's cheap junk. But they work, and they look right in the car. When they break, I'll replace them. You know, the car came with Stuart Warner gauges. None of them worked. Um, it's got a low car shifter. <sighs> Generic spoon-style accelerator pedal. Um, again, you know, nothing fancy. Um, the interior is worn ratty but it does its job now when I first got this car it had uh, fully fendered and everything but I had to remove them because the drivability was horrendous so to get the fenders on this car they needed to lift up the car both front and rear by about six inches and underneath the perch and underneath the rear perch was a uh, six inch block like that so it would lift up the suspension okay the problem with that is it threw the geometry all off and it was beyond squirrely when you're driving it it was just outright scary so i tried to do the best i could i got custom made radius rods um nothing fixed it so what i did was i removed the lowering blocks which forced me to take the fenders and the running boards off. Um, and if I can find a picture of it, I'll actually put it into the video if I can, of what it looked like when I first got it. And, uh, you know, once I lowered it and took out those blocks, it actually rides, okay, it's not great. I mean, if you've ever driven in a T-bucket, they're not known for great handling. It's a solid front axle. So, you know, you hit a bump, you feel it from one side to another side. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much all you have on the Ford. It's got a turtle deck on the rear. Uh, and the body, so the tub, the body, it's all fiberglass, um, plywood floor. Uh, this ammo can is actually in my glove box, um, because that's all you got. Uh, decent sized fuel tank you know manual disc brakes it stops fine um, the suspension geometry is still a little off on the rear uh, hard to see but those shocks come in way too far um, again because of it having full fenders the rear had to come out much farther than it normally would be that's why you have about a foot of gap between the body and the tire so how do you fix that you narrow the rear am I gonna do that no it's not worth the time or the effort but anyway that's a rough overview of the 23 now the one that a lot of people ask me about is this guy right here 
This is a 1958 Dodge Coronet. Um, I've had this car for, I don't know, eight, nine years now. Um, I bought it as a work in progress. It was not fully functioning when I got it. Um, let's see, the biggest problem was it was leaking power steering fluid all over the place. It did not want to start. Um, a whole myriad of things. So it's not in perfect condition, far from it. It's also dirty from just driving it the last few days. I gotta clean it. Uh, get an idea of the inside. So, lots of metal with a little bit of vinyl leather covering the dash. You got the rear seats. And as far as I know, the interior is still pretty much all original. What's been replaced, um, trying to think here, this is not the original steering wheel. This is a steering wheel that I found and restored in the garage, so it's not perfect. Um, the brake handle, another one that I restored in the garage because the parking brake handle that I got was broken in half. The radio, even though the radio looks original from the outside, it's actually um, an original shell and a USA Customs or Radio One, whatever the classic car radio company is. Um, it's a aftermarket radio that's put into a shell of an original 1958 radio. I do have the original radio. The reason why I changed it is um, I had a friend of mine actually rebuild the original radio, which it works perfectly, but it's AM only. And we were driving this car a little bit more often than not and getting am around here wasn't great and the stations you could get were pretty much all talk so you know we wanted to hear some music and uh that does help um it's actually a very stripped down car it doesn't have a lot of features at all the only feature it does have when i first got it would have been power steering and a v8 so oh and automatic it's got the 727 push button which is neat. Not a lot of people know about that. Now the engine has been heavily modified before I even got the car. So that is a 325 Hemi. Now for the Mopar guys you know that in 1958 they didn't make a 325 Hemi. They made a 325 Poly. Well the block is original to the car. The heads are different. The only difference between a 325 Poly and a 325 Hemi are the heads and the pistons. So, someone, not me, modified this and pulled the original polyspherical heads off and they put on Hemi heads. Now, did they go through all the work and put in the correct Hemi pistons? I have no idea. And I haven't taken a bore scope to go in there and check it out, but, you know, um, it does, it's fine the way it is, it works. So, why is that important? Because you'll hear a lot of guys sit there and say, hey, you know, you're modifying the car. The engineers designed it a certain way. You should leave it that way. Okay, I'm not going to agree or disagree with that. What I'm going to say, though, is I bought a car that was modified. Um, so, for me, making modifications to it on an already modified car doesn't hurt that badly, I guess you would say. So... The modifications that I've done over the years since I've had it is new radiator because the original one had several pin hole, you know, in it, a bunch of pinholes, cracks. It was just, it, it would have cost more to rebuild it than a good quality, you know, radiator. Um, I have put in an alternator instead of the generator. Actually, when I got it, it was had an alternator. It wasn't the right alternator. It didn't work right. Uh, the power steering pump that came in there was... I don't even remember the name of the company. Um, it wasn't like Saginaw. It was another company. Um, I want to say it began with an L. An L or a K or something. Anyway, that was dead. I never even had one, to be honest with you. I eventually bought one and then found out that no one restores them. So... It had a Saginaw in there, and I actually had to make the bracket that holds it in there um, because the bracket that was in there was so off 
kilt, I guess you would say, that it was causing the belts to snap on me. Um, now the car came originally with four manual drums. I have upgraded to four power disc. Okay, why? Long story short, the rear drums were warped. The cost of new rear drums was a fortune, about $800, I think, for both of them. Um, and at that point, I could have just replaced them with disc, and, you know, getting parts for a disc brake is a lot easier than getting parts for a 1958, you know, 65-year-old drum. So we started running it with manual disc. This car is way too heavy to, to, to stop safely. Upgrade it to, to um, power. That works fine. What I did have to do, though, was add a booster, which is what this guy is here. So this is basically creating our vacuum. When I would run it off of the engine boost, or the engine vacuum, um, the biggest problem that I was having is, if I was, say, in a parade, and I was idling for long periods of time, uh, I'd lose vacuum pressure to the point where the car would stall. As soon as you get on the gas, that would correct itself and you wouldn't have the issue. So, the theory is, even though this is not a high horsepower engine, because of the modifications with the heads and all that, it caused it to have a decrease in vacuum. Um, so, easier just to run a secondary pump it works fine. I've had it in there for a while now, never given me a problem. Now I say that, probably give me a problem, but point is, uh, it alleviated a problem. So, as things on this car wear out and break, the first thing I try to do is have it rebuilt. Um, and if I can't get it rebuilt, I upgrade or replace with whatever is available. So, like when the steering, um, the steering box was leaking when I first got it. I found a guy called Steering Gear, I believe, out of Ohio, who rebuilt the steering box for me. Um, he's about one of the only guys who does it. Uh, you'd think, okay, it's just a regular steering box. No, it's not. There's a lot of intricate things with this car that uh, it seems like there's only a few handful of people that actually work on this and know how to work on the parts in this. So um, he, he rebuilt it for me, did a great job. And it's been great ever since. Um, you know, the carburetor is, as far as I know, I mean, it's original. It's a, it's, it's a, um, a Carter WFCB, uh, and it would be for a 1958 Dodge. So it's very possible it's the original one for the car. When I got it, it needed a rebuild. I rebuilt it here. It was easy enough to do. Um, another problem that I had was, I'll show you, the fuel pump. The original fuel pump or the, the fuel pump that was on there was wrong so it kept leaking and I thought okay I just have a bad flaky fuel pump so I replaced it. That one would leak. I replaced that again. That one would leak. I finally smartened up and went down to um, Cantor's over in Booton and said do you have a fuel pump for a 325 poly Hemi? And it was a completely different part that, that was on there. Once I put that new fuel pump on there, the one from Cantor's, never had the problem again. It was not leaking anymore. It was not giving me any problems. It worked fine. So a lot of it was someone prior to me was doing some shade tree mechanics and backyard mechanics. And they might have been just throwing parts that they had in there. And that obviously did cause some issues. So I'm also documenting every change that I make. This car is not going to be with me forever. It's eventually going to be sold or whatever happens to it. And whoever the next owner is, they're going to want to know what's been done to it. So that's under the hood. You know, a shot of the front of the car. And it's funny, my youngest son, Max, asked me last night, I believe, you know, why did you buy a 1958 Dodge? Um, oh, another modification I did. I've upgraded the wheels and tires. Again, I did this for a reason. Three of the original wheels that I had on there had some type of problem. Um, one was rusting. One was warped. And the other one wasn't even round anymore. 
and then the fourth wheel wasn't even the right wheel so again it was easier for me to buy four um riddler wheels which is just the brand and cooper tires on there put those on it's actually the same size they're wider off of course than the original ones but they're the same outside diameter so what that means is my speedometer hasn't changed a couple other changes you'll see that there are speakers in the rear now okay so a stock one a 1958 you know plain jane uh coronet would have only had the one speaker in the middle of the grill when i upgraded the radio i wanted to put in additional speakers the trunk i do apologize it's a mess but we drive this car we take this to cruise nights on fridays and one of the things about that is we'll have you know some picnic uh, chairs in there we'll have a table um a spare cooler games because the kids want to play games and stuff like that so they're playing chess or checkers or battleship or whatever board game they want to bring and then there's always tools so one thing you know i think for most of us that own a classic cars we keep a tool bag with us because there's always a possibility something's going to break um it sucks but it's also part of owning one of these cars so i got my tool bag in there um extra things like coolant things like that oil always good to have and uh yeah but going back to why i bought a 58 dodge so max asked me well dad why'd you buy a 58 dodge well when i was a little kid or not so little but when i was younger one of my favorite movies was christine which is a 58 plymouth fury now try to find a 58 plymouth fury for a decent price that's not completely rotted out it's not going to happen but try to find a 58 Dodge Coronet that's not rotted out for a decent price. That's a lot easier. It's not super easy, but it's not impossible. And the nice thing about this is it shares a lot of the same heritage as the Plymouth Fury. I actually have a picture somewhere of the assembly line in Detroit where one side you have uh, Dodge Coronets, Lancers, the regals whatever the uh the you know the trim package is on one side of the assembly line and on the other side are the plymouth furies so they were made in the same assembly line they were made in the same plant and there's a little bit of commonality there so it's not the car that i always wanted um but it fills that that need or not the need but the niche that i wanted which was um a 50s fin car that's different from everything else. So, you know, I go to a car show. I don't see any other Mopars from the 50s. If I do, it's one or two, and it's very rare. And they're usually either a earlier 50s or they just jump to the 60s. So finding a 57, 58, 59 um, Dodge, Mopar, anything is a rarity. And I like that. I like being the only one with that kind of car there. It's different. So, anyway, um, I hope this answers some of your questions. And, again, I'll give you another pan over of the 23. You get an idea of what that looks like. You get an idea of what the 58 looks like. Um, I got a 1980 Corvette, and I'm not trying to show off my cars. This is not that kind of thing. It's like a poor man's Jay Leno, I guess you would say. Uh, none of these cars are Concord anything. Um, they have dings, they have dents, they get driven, they have rust. Uh, you know, they're just fun to drive and they don't cost a lot. You know, they, this, this is the kind of hobby where you could spend very little. And as long as you have some kind of mechanical abilities, you could do a lot of this work your own. Um, or you could spend a fortune. So it really comes down to the user and uh, what your limitations are. Anyway, thanks for watching and uh, see you guys later. Bye.